thinking about this before you came here, and oh, today is December the 18th of 2002. Um, I was thinking about what well, it's possible to try and talk and teach somebody the banjo this way, or why don't I just start slowly and maybe we can teach Russell how to play the banjo after all. That'd be great. So um, it doesn't matter to me for playing old time style banjo, which is what I'm going to be doing most of the time. I'm going to be playing with the back of one fingernail. It doesn't seem to be important to have long fingernails to me. I don't take care of my hands particularly, so I don't think that's important. And I think that's one of the beauties of playing old time banjo is you, you're using the back of a fingernail and a thumb. Now as long as you have some sort of uh, remains of a thumb and one fingernail, you can probably play claw hammer banjo with your right hand pretty well. Um, it doesn't matter which finger you use. I started playing with my third finger when I was a kid, and hmm. one of the first farmers I met played with his old finger. So for the first, those were the fingers. That was a little finger strum there. Um, I think it's really important to tap your foot because it gives you a good sense of rhythm and it keeps things steady. And he who cannot keep rhythm cannot stay in a band. I think Confucius said that once. So I'm going to play with either my second finger or my third finger. Those seem to be the two fingers that I play with. And I do them, I, they, they play in a tune I can involuntarily go from one finger to another with my playing right hand finger. Um, it doesn't seem to matter. I just If one just suddenly says, I'm out of here, then the other one takes over. And I don't think about it, it's just an involuntary thing. So either one of those two fingers seems to be the ones I play with. Never the index finger, because that never felt comfortable. Um, in, in a measure for old time banjo, you have four beats. So the first note is usually the melody note, and I'll say the third string, that string is going to be my first, if I'm writing out tablature, the first thing I write down is the first note of four beat measure, which would be your melody or striking note. Then you have a rest on two, and then three of the four counts would be your first string, and then the fourth beat would be your thumb. So if I were to just show you by picking up what it sounds like, it would sound like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. When my foot goes down, that's one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One can be on any string. Fourth string. Third string. Second string. sound like this. The melody is going to be on any string. The two outside strings seem to be filler, so you're going to play a melody note, note like do, tell, say, what, what part of your fingernail are you striking the string with? And my pen probably won't write very well, but it's, it's basically just the very corner of my second or third fingers. It's just the very corner. You don't have to have much nail.
a good teaching aid is the television. You can watch television all the time, and you can watch Oprah Winfrey, and you can watch Dr. Phil, Judge Judy, and the news and the weather, and you can sit there, and if your banjo is full of foam rubber, then it won't drive anybody nuts in the house, and you can just sit there and get tap your foot and get your hand used to this funny rhythm which is unique to the old time banjo. <laughs> So it's a four beat rhythm, but you're not doing anything on two. You have sort of a funny one, three, four, one, three, four, one, three, four loping rhythm. You can make it into an easy four smooth as silk rhythm just by what's called pulling off a string. So to pull off and get the, se the second beat into a note rather than a rest, all you have to do is play the first note. That's the third string open. Take your left hand and take whatever finger is comfortable and place it at the second fret of the first string and just pull that string off the side of the fingerboard. So it sounds, you play the first, I'm going to play the third string and then just take my left hand and pull off the first string and then play the first string open and the fifth string. So instead of sounding kind of lopey, sound like this. Somebody pointed out to me recently it doesn't matter where you put your hand to pull off the first string because it's going to be the same note. That's probably where uh, Troy, Leroy Troy got to start. So, um, that's simple right hand stuff. And you can put a note where the rest was by hammering on a string also. You can bring your left hand down on a string. Session with my left hand. Or I can play, I can hammer on the third string, second fret, and then hammer on the fourth string, the fourth fret. So tapping your foot and having a good solid right hand. taking a simple tune like Go Talent Roadie. If I were to describe this, if I were to name the strings when I'm playing banjo, I'd say it's three, rest, one, five, three, one, five, three, one, five. Alternating the first note can be four, one, five, three, one, five, two, one, five, one, one, five. Double thumbing 
you're going to be playing one, two, one, five. One, two, one, five. Usually, you, your thumb will play the second string. It's another way of making a very smooth sound playing clarinet banjo instead of being sort of, uh, you know, irregular, it becomes very smooth. You're going to play down on the first note on your first string with your whatever finger you're playing with. And then you're going to take your thumb over to the second string and play it. And then you're going to play again on the first string. And your thumb, you open up your hand a little bit and your thumb will be up to where it normally rests on the fifth string. So it sounds like this. for your technical stuff in playing clown or banjo. And you can brush the whole, all the strings of your hand and get a very full sound. that's a wonderful tune. Tunes that you have in your head already are the ones you should start playing first because half the battle is to learn the tune. The other half the battle is to work on a banjo. If you have tunes from childhood, those are the ones to work with first because you have half the battle won. <laughs> So Cripple Creek's pretty good. 
Uh, there are all kinds of wonderful tricks with Cripple Creek. For instance, when you play the, fifth, the first string of the fifth fret, that's the same as the fifth string open. There's a thing they call the Galax lick, which is just a lick. And then somebody learned it at the Galax Fiddler's Convention, so it became the Galax lick. But there are lots of old southern banjo players who like to just, instead of going all the way up and fumbling around on a fretless banjo trying to find the fifth string, the fifth fret on the first string, they just play the fifth string. <laughs> Kentucky in 1967, I was an ignorant person wandering around looking for banjo tunes. I'd ask these old geezers to play Old Joe Clark, and they said, never heard it. And tunes that were just not comfortable play, to play, just they just dropped them generations ago. Yeah. And around Whitesburg, Kentucky in 1967, I don't think I ever found anybody who could play Old Joe Clark. They just, just didn't bother. It's just such a stupid tune on banjo. It just didn't work very well. Because you have to play so many notes in succession. <laughs> Until I met Dan Geller, who's a great banjo player in yeah. Elkhart, Indiana, who said, well, if you slide up on the second fret, streets of Bloomington when I was a kid was Red Wing, and that's a big fun one to play around with because you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, uh, Red Wing started out as so it goes like this.
<laughs> every time you think you know every note and every tune, you just open the door and there's Dan Gillard or Ken Perlman or Howie Burst and Billy Fair. There's so many great banjo players. Rick Lee, I can name them forever. And just uh, so many wonderful banjo players and they all have musical brains that are different. Mm. And it just never ceases to amaze me. And I was thinking the other day, yesterday morning I woke up and I was thinking about a guy named Chris Cool who lives in Toronto, Canada. Who's another great up and coming? He's there. He's already. He's a great banjo player. He's a great banjo player right yeah. now. Yeah. But I I knew him when he was hungry and you know taking care of handing people sheets and stuff at Augusta Folk Festival so he could have a chance to be around musicians. Yeah. Yeah. Sixteen, and he's just like. <laughs> and now he's working on his third CD of old time banjo of oh. tunes he's made up and and uh, it just makes me very happy to think that. I was in his shoes years ago, sitting at Kyle Creed's feet, going, <laughs> and then, you know, just by sheer coincidence, there's generation after generation. There are a couple of people that come along who are just very, very, you know, they, they, they just, it's who they are. Somehow, somehow it makes their life complete to have a banjo and thump around and fiddle a banjo or a guitar. I don't play anything but banjo, so I only can relate this to banjo people, but it's been a great pleasure to see. Scott Prouty and, and Chris Cool slowly taking over the generation behind me of, you know, the next generation of musicians. There are some great musicians, and Jeremy Stevens, and so many people, are, it's a real privilege to meet them and watch them grow and hope and pray that they have great lives. Let's see, Tear Patch, as I said, the notes came from. Um, Ray Alden stopped through Kensington when I lived there and he said, I got this wonderful banjo tune on tape, but I can't figure out how to play it. So he played it and I said, got it, and I played it, as I remember. <laughs> and it's a wonderful banjo tune because it's really, it gets going pretty fast. Thank you. 
trailer down, Long Creek down, about a mile from my folks' house when they moved to Phoenix, Maryland. And he played fiddle and banjo and grew up in Southern Virginia. And he had no fiddle and he had no banjo when I met him, but he said, I used to play that stuff. So I had an old fiddle in high school, I had no banjo, so I left my old S.S. Stewart banjo with him and a fiddle. And I used to go down there with another banjo. And he was just a wonderful time fiddle player and he loved to play lots of tunes. And one of his favorite tunes was Cackling Hen. And he'd always say, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it. And he'd always stop and he'd always look at me. We'd be two of us in an old teeny trailer, knee to knee. And he'd be saying, can you hear the chickens? Can you hear them? Can you hear them? You know, it was just ridiculous. I, looking back, I laughed because he was such a wonderful old guy to a young kid who was just hungry for banjo tunes. Years ago, 1962 or something. 63, 63, 64, somewhere there. And um, so along came Flood Agnes, I guess in 68 or something, washed him away and his trailer and everything. That was the end of it all. I, I think he may have survived, I'm not sure, but the fiddle and the banjo and the trailer were gone forever. And uh, that was the end of it. So it was a couple of years of music with him. And uh, so I started playing Cackling Hand with him, and then I saw um, Dr. Horsehair, what's his name? Uh, Flesher, Bob Flesher. I saw him play it a couple of times. I never really, I never really tried to play it. I never copied anybody. I just sort of, I, I had Mr. MacArthur over my shoulder, you know, just those memories. So I figured out my own kind of version of it. Cackling him. to Cackling Hen, so I started, I want to include the second part because I remember it because I usually don't play No, no. cheapy cassettes you buy at a store and somebody gave it to me because they thought I'd enjoy listening to it and it's called uh, Picking in the Blue Ridge and Mark Pruitt and his band play Cap and Hand and it's just absolutely priceless. Absolutely the greatest cut ever that. <laughs> Thank you. 
as they say, Reed Martin never plays the same way twice. <laughs> he gets lost every time. <laughs> but he has fun. Because he was such a nice guy. He was probably, in my memory, the handsomest guy I ever knew. He just had a way about him. Knocked me off my feet every time I saw him. He's just, he's just Kyle. Mm. And I uh, played great fiddle, played great banjo, and took me over to his house and took me over to his shop, and just was a really nice guy to me when I was the next generation. Panting in the background, so he was just out there doing, doing okay. Kyle, and Kyle was just great. And he played fast enough. Tommy Jarrell always put me to sleep. Kyle Creed always cut me away. <laughs> tunes called Darling Nelly Gray. First one's called Chili Winds, and then the second one's called June Apple.
So this is a tune called Black Ray Blossom that I heard Peter Hoover play, and I loved it, and I said, where are you going now? Actually, wait, let me think. I'm not sure that's why Peter Hoover played Black Ray Blossom. Do, 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 do. I don't remember why. I don't know. I don't know offhand. I don't remember. It was 1964 when I was soused with Peter Hoover's banjo tunes and never recovered. And I don't think... I don't think Black Ray Blossom was one of the tunes he played. But anyway, I went to a spirit concert with Blood, Sweat, and Tears and Spirit. The next day, after sitting there with 5,000 stone people all around me, and I was just sitting there straight, I came out smelling like I had been smoking all night, but I hadn't been. The next day I woke up and I just had all this music in my head, and Black Ray Blossom was just there. Tunes. It's a lot of the finger picking is. machine and a little overhang 
two guys played music all night, and if you wanted to listen, that was fine. If they didn't, that was fine. And one of the tunes they kept going back to was called The Drunken Filler. And it was a bluegrass tune going this way. And it was just a mile a minute, and I sat there with my tongue down to my knee, and uh, I just never heard anybody play bluegrass filler. I never, my favorite bluegrass filler of all time is Joe Green. He just played with more body movement, more incredibly, it's just a sledgehammer yeah. drive, yeah. just incredible. And when he was out in the fields of Galax Union Grove and at this time Bristol, Tennessee, the rosin dust would just make a cloud. And you'd see this fiddle and bow in the, in the, in the night, you know, just this big white cloud going everywhere because he was just, just blood and guts fiddle yeah. and just great. And I just hope and pray that Joe Green is okay. And I wish he'd, I wish there were more recordings of him playing. Mm. Because he was the powerhouse fiddler. Mm. I never saw him play with more mm. abandoned, yeah. more guts than Joe Green. It was just wow. great. He'd drive you crazy in the parking lot. Just crazy. He'd be out there for six, eight hours of stretch, just playing his brains out. And all his banjo players would just be lying on the ground dead, you know, picked to death. And Joe would just be playing away. Charlie Hawks and Joe Green and all these wonderful people from those festivals. Heavy stomping. Um, so this is the tune called the Drunken Fiddler. Texas was the caller. I should be able to remember his name. Anyway, he was just a wonderful caller, and he did what every caller should do. He looked out and said, if you're not having a good time, I'm not having a good time. So if any problems, raise your hand and stop. And he looked out all these 45 RPM records, and one of them was called Jenny Lynn Polka by some uh, band. Yeah. And they started, you know, here I am on the dance floor, and Jenny Lynn Polka starts playing, and I just, my feet just went, Ooh. and that was it. I said to her, I can't dance, I gotta listen. And she said, oh no. <laughs> but Jenny Lynn Polk is just such a fun tune, and I never heard anybody play on banjo. Yeah. And I just had to, I just was, you know, one of those things that drove me nuts, so.
That's the advantage of tapping your foot. <laughs> you can get totally lost like I did and still finish it out. This is from Peter Hoover called Sally in the Garden. So you play your second string, fret at the first fret, and tune the string up while you play it. So you don't hear this sound, which is the sound you don't want to hear. Which means you forgot to play it while you were tuning it. The cuckoo.
call uh, uh, Peter Lohr's song or Hell's Rolling in the Kitchen. That's what Matt Walker called it when I was living in Indiana. <laughs>